Okay, so since we're a little bit slow, we just want to dive right in. Um, my job is just to keep these guys on time and playing fair, play nice. Um, <laughs> so we, we, we did a, a ceremonial rock, paper, scissors. Uh, Dr. Kavanaugh is going to lead off, but the format is going to be I'm going to ask a question, which they both had already. Mm -hmm. They get seven minutes each to respond. Mm -hmm. We're going to do this three times. Then I'll have a few questions for them that I have not disclosed to them, so we'll see how they think about these things on their feet. Uh, and then you will all have a chance to ask your questions. Um, so, the first question, uh, Dr. Kavanaugh, is there a conflict in principle between free market economics and a Catholic understanding of human flourishing? Why or why not? Okay, so I think you need to distinguish uh, between free market as such, and free market ideology. And I want to argue that there is uh, a conflict in principle between free market ideology and a Catholic understanding of human flourishing. What do I mean by free market ideology? Something along the lines of Milton Friedman, who says that an exchange is free if it's bilaterally informed and voluntary. In other words, if nobody's deceiving anybody and it's voluntary, nobody's being forced into it, then it's free, and so a free market usually means no state interference. And the corollaries of this view is a negative view of freedom. Freedom is when there's an absence of external interference, and there's no objectively agreed upon ends. People like what they like, and they ought to be able to pursue that. So a Catholic understanding of human free flourishing says that freedom from interference is not enough to determine when a market is free. So in the Christian view, if it's, if it's negative freedom, that's a necessary but not a sufficient condition for determining if something is free. So for example, if you have 20 bucks in your pocket and you're an alcoholic and the liquor store is open, then you're free in the negative sense to go and get what you want, but in a positive sense, this is not good for you and and there's another sense in which you're not free. So true freedom isn't just freedom from, but freedom for, a capacity to achieve a good end. And so true freedom depends on being able to distinguish good ends from bad ends. It depends on the existence of objectively good ends. So you need a substantive account of human flourishing in order to determine when somebody is free. So to be free, really, you need adequate food, housing, opportunities for rest, to raise a family, etc. All these things that are spelled out in Catholic social teaching. So you can see the difference in a desperately poor Bangladeshi woman who takes a job making clothing for 15 cents an hour. Free market ideology a la Friedman says she's free. She doesn't have to take the job. She can take the job or not. It's the free market and you can offer that low of a wage because of the way that wages are set by supply and demand. Catholic social teaching recognizes that she's not actually free. She's little better than a slave. She has to take the job because she's compelled to do so out of starvation. So free market ideology helps cover up and I'm gonna argue even produces the opposite of freedom because if you eliminate objective ends from the system, there's nothing left but power. So the absence of objective goods doesn't free the individual, but leaves it subject to the arbitrary competition of wills. If you take away objective ends, all that remains is power, one will against another, and the will is moved by the greater force, whatever that is, not by any intrinsic attraction to the good. So the difference between authority and power has been eliminated, and there's lots of ways in which you can see that working in a so-called free market. Um, marketing, for example, is used uh, to manipulate people in many different ways. Surveillance now takes a, a, an increasingly important role. Big data is in more and more in, intrusive. As Yuri Gall has written, despite the promise of big data to improve our lives, all-encompassing data surveillance constitutes a new form of power that poses a risk not only to our privacy, but to our free will. In other words, the more people know about you, the more they can manipulate you. And that type of surveillance capability is in some ways a byproduct 
of technological innovations, but more fundamentally, it's driven by a purely negative view of freedom with no objective ends. If there are no objectively desirable ends, then all that remains is the arbitrary contest of wills, and I'll try to gain whatever advantage I can to get you to choose the way I want you to choose. The example of making 15 cents uh, an hour in Bangladesh. By Friedman's definition, the workers there are free. Free market ideology, in other words, licenses us to ignore the power disparity between the multinational corporation and the poor Bangladeshi woman. And finally, where did this power disparity come from? Well, it takes a lot of unpacking to look at the power dynamics there. In closure, for example, both in the past and today, the privatization of formerly common resources, land, water, minerals, fish, genetic materials, uh, seeds, etc., pollution of the common resources like air and water for private gain. Um, this is an ongoing uh, situation where common resources are being privatized uh, for the benefit of the few. And so, in sum, free market ideology, I'm arguing, causes us to ignore the disparities of power in the market while simultaneously stripping away the ability to judge and exchange on the basis of anything but sheer power, since any common standard of good or ends has been eliminated. So to close then, I think I've got like 30 seconds left, I'm arguing that there's no such thing as the free market as such. You need something like a Catholic understanding of human flourishing to know when a market is free and when it's not free. State actors in the government. So we're not talking about this, uh, this sort of libertarian paradise of anarchy. That's not what you get with a free economy. But then once you get those preconditions and you get a particular kind of society that nurtures virtue, then you get a condition of economic freedom. And what you do, yeah, you get there's kind of minimal economic freedom would be something like people and firms are able to engage in things that they uh, see as mutually beneficial. So I can pay a butcher for his meat and I want the meat more than I want the money. He wants the money more than he wants the meat. We both serve our needs and the needs of our families. If that's free in a minimal sense, it's not free in a metaphysical sense. But of course, that minimal sort of definition of freedom is not freedom in the broadest sense, what philosophers call freedom for excellence. But that sort of qualifies. That's, that's what I mean by a free economy. There's nothing like that, just as John Paul II said, that contradicts the Catholic understanding. In fact, I'd put it more strongly. I would say not only is it there's no conflict in principle, I would say that of the live alternatives, of the kind of economic arrangements that we have actually tried in human history, this is the best of the live alternatives for doing the kinds of things you'd want an economy to do, for allowing cultures to emerge from absolute poverty, for instance, which is one of the most important things you would want for an economy to do. So I ultimately think actually the question, rather than sort of quoting papal encyclicals. John Paul in the same encyclical, for instance, says, okay, the church doesn't prescribe a detailed <coughs> political or economic program. What it prescribes is sort of prudential reflections on these perennial principles of Catholic social teaching. And so really, ultimately, I think the way we want to answer the question is empirically. Let's look and see what economic arrangements are best for allowing large numbers of people to emerge from poverty and to be able to flourish, meet the basic bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and do the other kinds of things that they think are important. So if you look at the index of economic freedom every year, just look at the countries at the top, look at the countries at the bottom. It's the ones at the top that people will risk their lives to get in. It's the ones at the bottom that they risk their lives to get out of. Nobody wants to live in those at the bottom. Poverty is alleviated. Absolute poverty is mostly non-existent at the top. It's rife at the bottom. So empirically, we know something that people didn't really know 100 years ago, which is that certain kinds of economic arrangements tend to help the poor. They tend to allow people a certain degree of flourishing that they would not have otherwise. And that, I think, ultimately has to be the question. And that's really, I think, the lesson, honestly, of the last 30 years. If you look at just what's happened, not in the United States, but globally, in the last 30 years, absolute poverty has dropped in half, We're talking a billion or more people. And we know why this happened. I, I hate to say it, it wasn't because of charity. Uh, it was not because of foreign aid, government to government foreign aid. What caused that? Well, it was liberal, liberalization of markets in places like China and India, right, where many people were desperately poor. Now, does that bring you 
utopia? Does that bring you the kingdom of God? Absolutely not. But scarcity is a reality in any economic system. And so what you want is a system that allows this kind of thing to happen. And it's nothing to sneeze at to discover a, a system a, a, of incentives, rule of law, technological innovation, private property, eco free economic and mutually beneficial exchange that allows us to actually resolve at least absolute poverty if never actually relative poverty. That's a good thing and it's not utopia. It doesn't solve all of our problems, but it's certainly better than the alternatives. Thank you. Um, so the next question is for Dr. Richards. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, that's right. Um, so what, if anything, should we as a society do to ensure that our economic life serves the common good? Catholic thought prizes the idea of the common good. Mm -hmm. So you might want to start off by saying what you think the common good is. That's a really good idea, actually. There's a big public debate about the common good right now, and nobody wants to define it. So let me, let me start um, by just, let's just define the common good in a kind of standard Catholic way. This is from the Catechism, quoting John Twenty-Third in Mater et Magistra. Here's how he defines it. it says the sum total, the, so the common good is the sum total of social conditions which allow people, either as groups or as individuals, to reach their fulfillment more fully and more easily. So in other words, the, the common good includes the kind of lower associations. The common good is not the general will of the French Revolution or the desire of an, an all-powerful state. The common, in, common good includes that which is common, say, to a nation as a whole, but also uh, must include and accommodate, for instance, the common good of your family. So the proper ends and goods of your family or of your association or of of your religious body. And so the common good is a, kind of an ideal situation in which you have a harmony between these different, different levels. And then so as he puts it, he says, it's not that it necessarily establishes everything that we would want. What it does is it establishes the sort of social conditions that allows groups and individuals to uh, reach their fulfillment more fully and more easily. So what role do markets play in this? Well, they play a role, they play only a partial role. The question is, should, what should we as a society do? And I think that's exactly right. Remember, society is not identical with the state. It's not identical with the market. Um, it's not identical with any particular member of society. If anything, society is uh, that sort of kind of pre-political reality of a people in its life. And so what that means is that there are going to be many things that we as individuals and we as communities should and ought to do in order to help people achieve both the common good of the whole and the common good of the parts. So what's, what's the kind of role of the market? I would just think of a market as essentially a network by which people uh, buy, sell, and exchange goods and services and information in a context of scarcity. So that's what a, a market at bottom is. And so what, what do you want a market to do ideally? I'd say well, one thing you want it to do is you want it to accurately communicate underlying economic realities. And the way that's normally done is through price signals. Um, so you, you don't get to sort of decide what the underlying economic realities are. You don't get to just, you can't legislate away the relationship between supply and demand. You can't legislate away the reality of scarcity. We can say, for instance, that everyone should have a, should, has a right to health care. That's not going to magically give everyone access to a heart that needs a heart transplant, right? That's, that's what economic reasoning allows you to do. It's what you want is whatever system you have, you want to take account of economic realities and you want the market to be able to accurately reflect underlying realities. So you want the market, insofar as it's possible, to tell the truth. And when it tells the truth, that gives us a way, it gives individuals and families and firms, a way to coordinate uh, and, and orient their, their particular ends and desires so that we can coordinate our actions with people that are entire strangers. So the existence of an iPhone, for instance, that's the result of hundreds of millions of people probably thousands of firms all around the world, most of whom don't know each other, remarkably, almost miraculously, coordinating their actions for production of something that no one person or even group of persons knows how to produce. How is that possible? Well, it re relies on the rule of law, it re relies on non-kinship-based trust, and it relies on accurate price signals. And so that's, I think, one of the most remarkable sort of insights of modern economics. So a healthy market allows, I would say, strangers to coordinate and cooperate their economic activity for greater benefit. It allows people to pursue what is important to them in a way that can also benefit others. OK, so what about the social safety net? When you hear the social safety net, what, what do you think? 
if you think, okay, who's the principal agent who is responsible for the social safety net? Right? We, we, in the 20th century, we got used to imagining that it's really largely the federal government that is responsible for that. Now, I think the federal government does have a, play, a role to play in this. Now, I think the, the overwhelmingly in the world that God has created, business and enterprise and innovation is the way in which wealth is created and poverty is alleviated. It doesn't mean that everybody enjoys that. And so we need structures and institutions that take care of people, either that fall between the cracks or that are in the middle of disruption through no fault of their own. So who's responsible for that? Well, I would say it's actually all those associations. If you follow the principle of subsidiarity, my children are my primary responsibility. They become the responsibility of the neighborhood or the city or the state if my responsibility breaks down for some reason. And I think this is the danger if we immediately assign the responsibility of uh, the social safety net almost exclusively or largely to the largest jurisdiction. This started, I think, in, in large measure in the 1960s with the war on poverty, which I think was a very well-meaning, possibly it might have worked, but as it turns out, uh, somewhat counterintuitive and counterproductive experiment. We now spend about a trillion dollars a year on, believe it or not, 80 or so means-tested welfare programs, and we haven't quite solved the problems. That'd be, that'd be totally worth the price, I think, if we actually solved all the problems. I don't actually, I don't hold out hope that some kind of measure of policies at that level is actually going to solve the, the pockets of poverty and despair that actually still exist in our community. So who's supposed to do that? Where do these things come from? I actually think uh, the poverty that we see in the developed world, so the poverty that you can find in a pocket so, someplace here in Philadelphia or in Appalachia or in the inner city of Detroit is in some ways a different thing and the poverty that exists ubiquitously in the less developed world. And so you can have a country that has all the institutions that allow for wealth creation. That country can have immigrants that come to this country that don't know the language. And within a few years, they can manage to emerge from poverty and send their kids to college. And yet we have neighbors that live right here and nevertheless are trapped in cycles of poverty. It's a long time, a complicated question. Where did those come from? I don't actually think that even though that type of poverty is an economic symptom and a problem, I don't think it largely has an economic cause and I don't ultimately think it will have an economic solution. I think it's largely the result of cultural changes with the sexual revolution, uh, which has devastated especially low income families, not so much upper income families. And until we get a hold of that, uh, the devastation at the cultural level, I think we'll have a very hard time, no matter how much we spend, solving poverty at the national level, the pockets of poverty that we still experience. Thank you. So, I want to point out ways that um, not just free market ideology, but also just free market practice, including the price signal, can cause us to ignore uh, the common good. Ideologically, you've got Milton Friedman quite explicitly saying there is no such thing as the common good. It's society is just a collection of individuals. Um, so the Catholic conception of common good is a uh, at odds with at least some verses, versions of free market ideology. But the practice of relying on just the price signal, for example, I think actually actively causes us to ignore the common good. So for example, when I buy on Amazon, all I'm thinking is, this is cheap and convenient. I see the price, I think this is a better price than I can get somewhere else. I click, it shows up on my doorstep, and I pay less. So what's not to like? But I think in terms of the common good, though, I have to take other things into consideration. Who made this product? How are they paid? How are they treated? Um, there's all kinds of stuff about how people in Amazon warehouses are being treated these days. According to Amazon, last year the median income for a full-time warehouse worker was just over $28,000 for the year, and that's median, meaning half of the people are earning even less. Jeff Bezos is worth $150 billion, on the other hand. Warehouse workers are expected to scan in a new item every once every eight seconds on average. Maybe you might want to argue that Amazon is not so bad, but the larger point is that we're encouraged by relying only on the price signal to, to not think about it. Right? So online shopping especially eliminates human beings from our view entirely. And free market ideology encourages us to consider only the product and the price, not just in theory, but in practice, right? 
all you see is the product. It's got a good price, you click on it, and uh, it appears on your doorstep, and you don't have to have any interaction with human beings at all. And there's even a convenient theodicy, a kind of explanation of evil that goes with this called the invisible hand, which assures us that it'll all work out for the maximum benefit of everyone if each individual pursues only their own self-interest. Catholic common good teaching demands that we not rely on such magical thinking. And it's worse than wishful thinking in a lot of ways because it teaches us to turn, to, turn a blind eye to suffering, uh, the culture of indifference that Pope Francis talks about. And it makes selfishness into a virtue. So how do we take the common good seriously? Um, I think Jay is right to say that it doesn't just happen at the governmental level, it has to happen at every level. As a consumer, we have to start trying to actually see people, find out as much as you can about the human beings involved in the process. Where does this come from? What happens to people and the earth in order to make it? How does it get here? Um, I don't buy from Amazon, for example. When I want a book, I call my local bookseller and they order it for me. And so I go down to the bookstore and I meet the person uh, in person. It leads to the flourishing, contributes to the flourishing at least of my community. But by local and fair trade when possible. So I have solar panels, I do public transportation, all that kind of stuff, banking locally. All of those kinds of things are a different way of living in the world, and it's a more joyful, liberating uh, way of living in the world, I think, because it puts you into direct contact with people, and so many times our economic system keeps us from actually seeing and interacting with other human beings. As a producer, I think everybody involved in business needs to consider the common good, and that's not often what's taught in business school, but it should be. Businesses are often encouraged only to consider shareholder value. Uh, lately, many businesses are belatedly talking about considering other stakeholders, employees, local communities, the earth. And there's lots of examples of successful businesses that take the common good seriously. The Mondragon Corporation in uh, Spain, for example, is a $3 billion in sales uh, a year corporation. It was founded by a Basque priest and it's based on certain principles of cooperative ownership and cooperative management. Um, that's possible. It, it, it actually happens. So at the level of consumers, at the level of businesses, and also at the level of government, as voters and public officials, we need to demand that the common good be talked about and taken seriously. I don't think it was good enough when Ronald Reagan asked us, are you better off than you were four years ago? That's not the question that I think we ought to be asking. I think the question, the real question is, are we getting closer to the common good? And I accept uh, Pope uh, John the 23rd's uh, definition of the common good, as Jay laid it out. Government generally serves special interests as part of the problem that we're dealing with. The head of the EPA, so it's not just that, that government is interfering uh, in the market, but government is interfering in the market on the behalf of those with power. The head of the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, is a former coal industry lobbyist. He's been busy eliminating protection so that businesses can trash common resources for private profit. And so we have to demand better um, at, at all of those different levels. But part of the problem is that our economy and our politics encourages us not to think about the common good but to pursue one's own self-interest, and that's part of the problem with relying solely on um, price savings. This kind of follows on on the are, are we having a problem with it? Are alarmed at it, about it, presumably because it threatens the common good in important ways. 
Um, so the question for you is, uh, how, how should we respond to such concerns about the growing inequality in our society? Yeah, it's a, it's a definite fact. The Census Bureau report in September said the income inequality in the U.S. is the highest it's been since they started tracking it in 1967. Um, worldwide in 2018, the richest 26 people in the world had as much wealth as the poorest 3.8 billion people. 26 people equal to 3.8 billion people. There are people that say that inequality doesn't matter as long as everybody's incomes are rising. A rising tide lifts all boats and that sort of thing. Um, but I don't think that's the, that's the case. This statistic about a billion people being lifted out of absolute poverty since 1990, I think, is also a really problematic statistic. It's based on a threshold of $1.90 per day. If you would make more than $1.90 per day, per day, you're no longer in absolute poverty. 80% of it comes from just two countries, India and China, one of which is still a communist country. And it's based on cash income, not wealth, meaning that people that have been left out or forced out of subsistence farming into factories their lives are not necessarily better, but just because they're getting a cash income instead of living on their own land, they're counted as having been lifted out of absolute poverty. The elephant graph, the Branko Milanovic's famous ele elephant graph, shows that since 1980, the poorest 50% of people worldwide show their income, saw their income grow by 100%, which is not as much as the top 1%, but it's actually better than most people in the top half. But the problem with the graph is that it measures percentage of income growth, not dollars. So if you start out with 10 cents and you grow it by 100%, you've got an extra dime. If you start out with a million dollars and you grow it by 100%, you have an extra million dollars. So the, part, the, the statistics that, that's being measured there is that the poor are getting an extra bag of chips and the rich get an extra Maserati. <laughs> Um, at the current rate of increase, it would take over 250 years for the income of the poorest 10% to merely reach the global average income of $11 a day. So there's good reason to be concerned about the rising inequality in our society and in the world more generally for good reason. Huge numbers of people are still desperately poor while uh, a small number of people have unfathomable wealth. In Jesus' parable of Lazarus and the rich man, the rich man goes to hell because he's rich and ignores the suffering of others. So the wide gap in this life becomes the wide gap between heaven and hell in the next life, and the rich man can't cross it. Secondly, wealth inequality affects everything else. Money is power, and the ability to make money in the future depends largely on the money one already has. And freedom, like everything else, has been commodified. The more money you have, the freer actions can be. And this is what's happened to our political system. We have a political system where you still have one person, one vote. But in our economic system, a million dollars has a, mil a person with a million dollars has a million more votes than the person with one dollar. So the Citizens United decision the Supreme Court blurred the distinction between the political and the economic by describing the political realm as a free marketplace of ideas in which money equals speech. And so the result has been obvious. Those with more money have more speech, so more political power. So this, again, the distorting effects of inequality on our democracy. So how do we respond? One way not to respond is to drastically cut taxes on the rich and on corporations and borrow another trillion dollars to pay for it, um, which is what uh, happened in 2017 from uh, President Trump and the Republican Congress. So how do we respond? Um, I want to suggest something that Christians used to do in the Middle Ages, uh, which is to shame the wealthy. Stockpiling wealth and spending it on luxury were seen as disgraceful, a sign that you were going to hell. And I still think that's the proper Christian response. If you want to see a good book on this, read David Cloutier's <laughs> book, The Vice of Luxury. He's one of your colleagues at Catholic U. The rise of inequality isn't just a matter of tax policy. In other words, it's a matter of culture. 
In the mid 20th century, business leaders talked about being in partnership with workers and took pride in caring for their communities. There was Fordism, the theory being you paid your workers enough so they could buy the products that they're making. Everybody is included in the prosperity. CEOs were still capable of shame. In 1965, the average CEO to worker income ratio was 20 to 1. In 2018, it was 278 to 1. That is, the average CEO made 278 times what the average worker made. And this is in large part because the culture has changed and business executives now feel entitled to take more. Meanwhile, the minimum wage is still at $7.25 an hour. And if you want to know why the family is doing so poorly, I don't think it's just because of the sexual revolution. I think it's because, uh, in large part, families can't cope uh, with the, the income disparity and the, and the stagnant wages. The culture change has led to changes in government policy. In 1965, the top tax bracket was 70%. Today it's 37% with lots of loopholes and the government has paid for the loss of revenue by borrowing trillions of dollars. And so one solution might be to tax the rich. Mm -hmm. Dr. Richard. Thanks so much. <clears throat> so as in the first two questions, I wanna urge us all to try to define terms. So what are we talking about? In, with respect to inequality, because there's lots of different kinds of inequality. Normally when we hear about it in, in sort of economic discussion, it's something like inequality of uh, either net worth or just income, income inequality or something like that, right? So now when you need to ask yourself the question, why exactly is income inequality a bad thing? Why exactly? Okay, so if I am, for instance, Jeff Bezos' net worth, I didn't run the numbers, right? His net worth is about 10 million times a million to 10 million times, I'm running it. So stick with me on the sort of orders of magnitude here, right? Ten, um, let's say it's 10 million times greater than my own. Um, my net worth is just a few orders of magnitude greater than say a sharecropper that's just crossed the border near San Diego, California, off the grid, uh, undocumented worker and is making very little money, right? So the gap, the inequality in numerical terms, right, is drastically greater between Bill Gates and me than it is between me and this, this poor fellow uh, in Southern California. So clearly it's the size of the gap. We, you know intuitively that's not quite the problem. What's the problem exactly? It, think about health, for instance. When we talk about a health gap, a health gap is some people are healthy and some people are sick. It'd be a weird way of framing the problem. The problem is that some people are sick, not that some people are healthy. Same way with respect to whether you're talking about income or net worth or whatever. The problem isn't that some people are wealthy unless they've gotten wealthy illegally or by confiscating wealth from someone else or something like that. The problem is that there's still people that are poor. Right? So the problem is actually poverty. And when discussions of gaps and inequality occupy the minds of a political order, it has in the 20th century tended to lead to disaster. Not actually helping the poor, not actually solving the problem, but rather focusing on this gap, which it kind of encourages a sort of native envy, either your own envy or a vicarious envy because there's somebody that's richer than someone else. So we want to know, okay, what's the actual problem? I'm not saying there are no problems that are involved uh, with income or net worth inequality, simply that that's actually not, I don't think, focusing on the morally significant thing, which is poverty itself. And then with respect to poverty itself, it's not so much poverty per se that's the problem, if people can wander in and out of different income groups, right? So when you're an undergrad or you're a grad student, you're probably in the bottom quintile, the bottom 20% of your uh, of incomes in the United States, but you'll wander in and out of this. So what an income sort of uh, inequality analysis is, is a time slice of a moment showing a distribution of incomes at that particular moment. What we want to know is do pe actual people do better over time, either over the course of their lives, or people in general over the course of a, a history of a country or not. That is, is there real income mobility? So somebody can come here from another country, they can work hard, uh, they can be diligent, and then their children can be US senators, right? That's income mobility. Or are they trapped in cycles of poverty from which they can never get out? That I would maintain is actually the real moral question. And so then you wanna ask yourself the question, okay, so what? sort of economic policies, what set of policies or what set of institutions 
is best at alleviating poverty generally and at uh, allowing this kind of income mobility? That's actually the real question. We deal with inequality because that's the sort of presenting symptom, but that's actually the question. And so then, again, you can compare countries, right, with respect uh, to people being able to emerge from poverty and people being able to move uh, and, and mo mobilize themselves, of course, from the bottom to closer to the top. So does that mean that we have a sort of perfect country here? Absolutely not. The reason I name this is because I think this, if you compare the kind of income mob mobility that existed in the United States at earlier times with the one that exists now, lots of people enjoy it. If you grew up with a father in your home, if your parents are still married, if you graduate from high school and go to college or trade school, and then go someplace where there are jobs, there is virtually no chance that you're going to be in poverty according to the kind of uh, standard except, you know, uh, economic ways of analyzing this. So income mobility for particular people, probably a lot of students at Villanova, is still really good. Who's it bad for? It's bad for white people in Appalachia who have seen cycles of poverty for generations, who in a sense see themselves as the government paying them to stay poor, many of whom don't know their fathers or have no father in their home. That is the single greatest predictor both of income immobility and childhood poverty, is the presence of a father. So you can actually have a really good and useful set of economic institutions at one level uh, and allow people to mobilize from the bottom to closer to the top and still fail for other people. And I mentioned already why I think that is, so I won't, I won't repeat it. I think that the primary problem here is not a bad thing has happening in the United States. It's obviously the result of free market ideology, and so we need to fix it. We have a bad thing that's happening that has economic consequences that's actually the result of something that I think is distinct from an economic problem. The other thing to remember is that it's tempting to, uh, to import economic fallacies into our thinking about gaps or inequality. The late Steve Jobs did not get rich stealing iPhones from homeless people, right? It's not how this works, right? What happened? That wealth wasn't already out there, right? Steve Jobs and his company participated in a process of wealth creation that created fabulous wealth for him, sure, but also wealth for many other people. And so it's not a zero-sum game in which one person has to succeed, somebody else has to lose. Moreover, wealth is not a fixed, finite amount of material stuff. That's the materialist myth in which we just identify the wealth in an economy with however much stuff there is at a particular moment. Human beings, under certain conditions, are capable of creating value and wealth for themselves and others that was not there before. And so whether you're in India or you're in the United States in 2019, what we should want is a set of economic and cultural and social institutions that's best for both channeling our legitimate narrow interests, the self-interest that we have for our families and our communities in ways that allow us to do that and also to create value for ourselves and others. Thank you very much. Okay, that's the first round of uh, tonight's uh, exercise. I think we just got really articulate and good descriptions of approaches to the question of how do we think about the morality of Marx and some line of half and thought. Um, from my perspective, somebody's worked in this area for a long, long time, you can't think well about the subject without hearing both voices. The challenge is how to bring them into conversation with one another, which I think we all struggle with. So um, I did not warn them about this. But I wonder if the place to start is for you to respond to each other. Um, what do you wish the other person understood? What questions do you have for them? And to go by the boundaries and doing Dr. Richards to go first. So, so Mary, do you want me to ask Bill questions? Tell me what you want me to do. How would you engage in all Oh, OK, so on some of his things. Well, I, we agree, actually, that there's a difference between free market ideology and a free market economy. So that's why I wanted to give a de definition of that. I just think it's obvious that there are some people that advocate a free market whose political philosophy is going to be incompatible with Catholic social teaching and Catholic theology. Um, he's exactly, we actually agree about the different types of freedom. There's a minimalist freedom of indifference versus a sort of uh, freedom for excellence. Um, some of the things that actually sort of amuse me is that um, I'm talking about the importance of price signals for allowing us to make decisions, right? Um, and so Bill argued that, well, but we shouldn't just focus on price signals. But of course, no one argues that. No, absolutely no one would argue that you should only focus on price signals. The great thing about a free market economy is that you can 
do what you did, right? You can say, I don't want to shop at Amazon. I read a story in The Economist about how the workers are being treated. I want to shop locally or go to the local bookstore. That's an exercise of your economic freedom, right? That, that's precisely what's possible in a society that enjoys economic freedom, is that you can actually do that. And all of us do that. In fact, we could, we've never known as much about the supply chains of uh, goods and services than we do now. And countries, the companies are constantly worried about word getting out about some problem in their supply chain. And so many of these things, whether it's at Apple or at Starbucks, that's actually a part of the market because they know that customers worry not just about the price of things, they worry about what employees are, how they're being treated and what's actually happening and were dolphins killed in the production of this, right? That's, that's a part of the market. So there's nothing about a market that can accurately communicates price signals that requires us only to attend to those. But if we don't have those accurately, we actually don't have a way of accurately coordinating our activities. And so there's a danger in constantly slipping from the nature of economic freedom and then slipping into a kind of free market ideology that specifies certain things. In the same way that you know, people, God gives us freedom and we can exercise it well or badly. Economic freedom is the same way. We can exercise it well or badly. We can exercise it in a way in which we buy things that are good for us and our families and that we actually need. Or we can buy internet pornography, which is an absolute disaster. Right? And incidentally, commitment to a free market economy does not specify ahead of time what things are appropriate for sale. So I don't know any defender of the free economy, for instance, that thinks slavery and the selling of human persons should be legal. So there's nothing about a defense or appreciation of a free market economy or the free economy that requires you to be an anarchist or to deny these wider questions about the truth and the reality of the common good, the value of the human person, or to make decisions that maybe you'd say, well, I'm not going to pick the, the cheapest thing, but I'm going to pick something uh, that is in accord with my values, even if it's more expensive. That's great. That's just that's what that's called is economic freedom. Yeah, um, I, I, that's, I mean, we agree on several things, one of which is that um, state intervention is not by itself going to produce uh, freedom. But I'm a little bit, I mean, this, this last point, um, we don't, we have the power to not shop at Amazon. And that's what makes it a free market. And I think in some senses that's true. Um, we do have uh, certain kinds of choices. But what I'm afraid of is that that ignores the real disparities of power that are there, right? I mean, technically you do have the power not to shop at Amazon, but the fact is that Amazon has an enormous amount of power in the current economy. And a lot of people feel that um, they have no choice but to work for Amazon for substandard wages and in substandard conditions. And a lot of people feel that um, they have no choice but to buy from Amazon, even though they do have, have certain kinds of choices. But the problem is not a simple sort of coercion. The problem is more a kind of seduction. And this is a, one of the things I think uh, Vincent Miller is, is right about. We're seduced not to think about how it's produced uh, in factories overseas because all you see when you shop online is the products, right? All you see are these glistening products. You see the happy packages with the smiles on them that show up on people's doorsteps. And you're encouraged not to think about what all of the blood and the sweat and the tears that goes into the actual production of the products. And that's, that I think is, is part of the problem. So there's this this system that, that has a disparity of power. And so it's not as if there's, it's a simple choice between freedom and unfreedom. What I'm trying to point to is the way that power actually works um, in the so-called free market to skew, the, to, to skew the results of such markets. And that then I think pertains as well to the question of whether or not wealth is a problem or only poverty is a problem. I want to actually make the argument um, that wealth itself is a problem, and that in three ways. So in other words, if nobody's poor, then it shouldn't matter if, if a bunch of people are wealthy. But I don't think that that's um, actually the case. I actually want to make the case that wealth in itself 
is problematic for three reasons, three possible reasons. One reason is the question of where did the wealth come from? I mean, it is certainly possible that people create wealth out of a new invention of, you know, they invented a better uh, mousetrap and so on, and that then uh, is gonna make the world better and it's gonna produce, uh, produce more wealth ex nihilo, out of nothing in some ways. But there are other forms of wealth that are made not by such creation, but by um, unfair advantage in the marketplace, taking advantage of that to accumulate wealth and power. And so the question of where Jeff Bezos' wealth comes from, I think, is, is important. How much are the people being paid that are actually producing the wealth that, that he then uh, appropriates for himself? That's a really relevant question, and that, that's a question that needs to go across the board. So, so I'm, I'm not saying that everybody who is wealthy has ill-gotten gains, but some do, and that's a, a really relevant question that I want to look at. The second question about wealth being a problem is what kind of power does it give to the wealthy, right? If uh, Bloomberg, for example, has the power to come in and alter the entire shape of an election just because he happens to be wealthy, uh, if money talks in our political system, where it very clearly does, then too much wealth is a possibility. Too much wealth has a distorting effect on democracy. And the third question then is, what is wealth doing to our souls? What does wealth do to one's souls? This is the question that David Cloutier addresses in his book, The Vice of Luxury. Luxury is, is, used to be considered in Christian traditions a vice. And it's a vice because there's a, certain, um, there, there's, a, there's a certain kind of evangelical poverty that you find in the gospel that is oftentimes extinguished by too much, too much wealth. Lazarus in the story that Jesus tells, in the parable that Jesus tells, it didn't say that he acquired his wealth by ill-gotten gains. It just said that he was wealthy and he didn't share it with Lazarus, the poor person who sat at his gate. He spent it on himself rather than on the poor person. And that, I think, is a relevant consideration. So I'm going to make the argument that, um, that it's not just the case that poverty is a problem, that wealth under certain com conditions can also be a, uh, an issue. I would uh, love to pursue this with more questions of my own. Um, but because of our delays, we wanted to have time for an audience question. So I want to throw it over to you. Um, Otherwise, we'll point, on some, point someone at random and ask a question. So. <laughs> the lights are on. <laughs> <laughs> it's being recorded. So some of this has been addressed already, but let me just refer to that, offer a frame. It's, I, I sometimes wonder if a lot of the anguish we have over the nature of a just economy and free market is rather just a growing fear of inequality. I know Mary's pointed out many times how Adam Smith was, was in his uh, wealthy nation was concerned about inequality as regardless of the total wealth of the country as it, in itself uh, a problem. And if the present age, uh, if a lot of our anxiety doesn't arise from the feeling or intuition that increasing inequality is actually just a great driver of wealth creation overall. And so that we fear to challenge the idea of inequality precisely because we're aware that there's a great deal of good coming out of it and that inequality becomes the price we pay for it. But Bill, some of your comments uh, indicated that, in fact, that may be a misperception. So just if both of you could just think of, uh, offer a few thoughts on is inequality per se a problem, or is it the price we have to pay for uh, the, the present wealth of nations? Here we go. Um, is there an order? Okay. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think you're absolutely right to bring Adam Smith into this because he was concerned 
that his system of uh, supply and demand really doesn't work where you have monopolies, right? And so um, I, I think that's, that's absolutely right. Adam Smith's system works, the, the idea of supply and demand works based on the idea that you've got a bunch of players that are more or less of the same uh, proximity for one thing and more or less the same size. And so you, if you go to the market and you want to buy a pair of shoes and somebody else is sh selling the same pair of shoes for $4 less, then you're going to go over uh, and get the market from them and the price is going to adjust and those sorts of things. But when you have monopolies, then it distorts the, um, the, the way that the, the market actually works. So if there's only one stand where you can go to buy shoes, then, um, then you don't have a, a kind of free market anymore. And so Smith was actually attentive to these issues of power that I'm trying to raise uh, as well. It may be the case that um, you have other places, you have other choices, uh, I can go to the local bookstore instead of Amazon to buy books. Um, but a lot of local bookstores have gone out of business precisely because of the power of Amazon. Uh, and my local bookstore is hanging on by a thread. So one, once that goes, um, I, might, I might not have a, a choice. And so that's part of the, that's part of the issue here. Um, with inequality, so that I, th I think we just need to, we're encouraged to talk about free markets as if they were just there and they were free. Um, and what I'm trying to get us to look at is just the disparities of power that exist and the way that distorts what's actually free and what's not free. So I think Jay and I agree that the free market is a good thing. Um, I th I'm just pressing us to actually try to determine on a kind of micro level what actually is a free market and what's not a free market. What's a market in which freedom is not operating uh, the way it ought to be? Let me say a few words about inequality and something I, I, I'm interested in information economics. So the particular types of uh, economic arrangements and dynamics in the information economy. And there's a number of economists at MIT in particular uh, who are predicting actually that what we're going to see is greater um, sort of fractal inequality in which the 1% pulls away from the 99% and the one-tenth of a 1% pulls away. And the reason is because of particular network effects in information technologies in which you have these non-rival goods. And um, so you can get people that can be fabulously wealthy. They didn't sort of extract wealth from the economy. It's, it's something new. Right? Nevertheless, they're sort of pulling away. And so I think there's just a bunch of stuff to be said about that. I think the, the most serious one would be what Bill said, which is this kind of inequity of power. But I would say that's a reality. Um, if you are richer than someone else, you're going to have more power. If you're more attractive than someone else, you're going to have more political power. If you're more articulate, you're going to have more power. Right? And so the question is, okay, so what do we do about that exactly? Um, well, I mean, there's a couple of things we could do. We could tax everyone at 99%, right? And then we'd extract that. But what, remember, our argument was that we're trying to avoid concentrations of power. Remember that. So who's doing the taxing? You know the answer, right? So the argument for reducing this inequity of power is to give the entity that has all the nuclear bombs and the guns and the tanks and the jails more power, right? Which seems sort of counterintuitive. To me. So that's the first point. The second point is that the good news is that not all billionaires vote for the same, right? So in a sense, they generally balance each other out. Thank God. Now, they may all end up woke capitalists and they're all thinking the same, but at the moment, we've got both Michael Bloomberg and Peter Thiel and, you know, uh, Donald Trump, right? And so, so in a sense, they balance each other off in that way. And that seems to me actually a better arrangement than concentrating the power in the hands of the, the, the most powerful entity, which is the state. The third thing is that if you actually just look at countries that have lots of billionaires, so just focus on the billionaires, the countries who are the, with the most billionaires per capita are also the countries where the poor are the best off. And so there actually is, I, I don't know why that is, it's not because they're all philanthropists, I think it's because the economic uh, conditions that allow some people to become billionaires allow other people to uh, pay off their house and things like that. The other thing to remember about billionaires, like Jeff Bezos, who I think you know, is worth $150 billion or something, 99.9% .9 of that wealth is illiquid. He is not hoarding that wealth. 
that, that wealth is actually creating value, right? It's, it's it, it mostly in stock options and things like that. And so that's the difference between the entrepreneur who creates value and gets wealthy, but has his wealth doing something versus the medieval miser who simply hoards his gold coins in his, uh, in his mattress. And so I think all those things actually matter to the, to the moral equation that we, we bring to this. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in the idea of shaming the wealthy and of wealth being bad in and of itself. So I was wondering if you could both actually comment um, on the idea of wealth being bad in and of itself, and particularly where that might be present in Christian traditions. Um, and the second, um, the idea of shaming the wealthy, I think that maybe especially on college campuses, there's this like shame shaming, um, where any kind of experience of shame is in and of itself bad. Um, so I was really struck, um, particularly like talking about that this in the context of the Villanova's campus of like how how shaming the wealthy might be good. Yeah, I, I mean, I was trying to be a little provocative uh, by <laughs> talking about that. But um, what I'm trying to get at uh, on a more general level is this idea that you create a certain kind of cultural expectation of how people are going to behave with their wealth and, um, and the responsibilities that that brings with them that in many ways have gotten eroded over the course of the second half of the 20th century and into the 21st century. And so um, there used to be, I think, um, a little bit more of a kind of civic idea that at least you ought to be using your wealth to um, uh, not just to buy another fleet of cars or another house and, and so on. Uh, that, that ostentation was not celebrated, um, but was looked on kind of askance. A um, and that what you really ought to be doing with your wealth is taking care of your business, taking the care of the people that work for you, and taking care of the communities uh, in which they were. Um, globalization has helped to fray those kinds of communal ties because oftentimes people shut down factories in the local town and ship them over to another side of the world where we don't see uh, the people anymore. And at the same time, that allows uh, people then to, to this kind of cultural change where the idea that a CEO makes 300 times what the average worker makes is no longer considered to be uh, irrational or shameful. Um, and so those are the kinds of things that I think um, it, it would help if we um, brought back a little bit of a sense. I mean, what I'm really trying to get at by using this term shame is more the sense of uh, common good and responsibility that um, we get away from this idea, well, it's their money and they can do whatever they want with it. Um, look, at, look at him, he's got a, you know, $150 billion, isn't that awesome? Um, and instead say, hmm, isn't that problematic uh, instead? And what, you know, what are ways in which we can foster uh, local um, uh, forms of communi community that actually kind of take uh, human beings into account? And th this is, I, I think, part of what, why Pope Francis constantly uses the term idolatry when he talks about the modern economy and modern money. He's, um, he's a very loving, accepting person but he's brutal when he comes to talk about the, uh, the modern economy because it's a kind of idolatry um, that uh, Jesus talks about when he says you can't serve both God and mammon. You cannot serve both God and wealth. It becomes a kind of rival God. And, and that, I think, uh, those are Jesus' words and not mine. It's, but that's something that I think we need to, you know, as Jesus once said, and I think he was completely right about that. <laughs> Of these things purely in economic terms, and there's a lot of social 
stuff going on, a lot of psychological stuff, a lot of cultural stuff, and political things, and, and how we intervene in them. Uh, let me take the opportunity to thank you both uh, for coming. It was a wonderful presentation, and, uh, and I think we're all appreciative of seriously reasoned and civil discourse at the same time. It's a uh, uh, rare so thank you for that. Um, I want to point to, a, I think there's a tension between uh, price indicators on the one hand as an individual good and a sense of the common good. And I want to uh, throw out a uh, a distinction and see if that can help us address that tension. Uh, Mark Sagoff makes a distinction between um, values and wants and says that we can have rational discourse about values, uh, but we can't have rational dis discourse about wants or preferences. Those are arbitrary and individual. Um, so I wonder if that can help us sort of address you know, the tension between individual choices and the common good. Um, I, you know, I mean, I think I'm Catholic, so I think it's perfectly okay to tell somebody, actually, you want that, and that's bad. You know, you shouldn't want that. There's nothing wrong with telling someone that. Yeah, maybe it's available. Maybe it's, you can buy it freely. Uh, maybe the, the, having a law against it uh, would, would be counterproductive. But there are lots of, lots of things that we might want that we might be able to buy that are actually bad. Um, I do think that th there's something important. In order for prices generally... Uh, both to serve, let's assume that you're in a situation, right, where we're uh, not in a normal coercive situation. I'm, I'm a butcher and uh, you're a baker, right, and we're exchanging goods and money. It's a kind of just a normal market situation, right? Um, in general, Smith's argument is that that can serve the common good. That was his idea. It wasn't that it always leads to the kind of greatest outcome, but that in what he called the natural system of liberty. So you have a rule of law. Certain things are ruled out. Right? There are certain things can't be done. Then that sets up a, a, a sort of game, a, a social situation in which people can exchange freely, and they'll do so um, if it's mutually beneficial. Right? Now, there's a thing that economists call externalities in which you have something that might not be relevant to us. Right? It's not directly re represented by the price, but is nevertheless a cost. So maybe, maybe the butcher is dumping the, the carcasses of the cows in the local river or something like that, right? Well, in that case, the price signal is not capturing the full cost. And so then the question is, okay, what do you do? Well, that's what the law is for. So as I said, a, a, a free economy is not anarchy. And so they, there's multiple ways of doing that. You can just find them, right? Or you can have a law that requires the, the butcher to dispose of his stuff properly, and then that will cost him something, and that gets reflected into the price. And so. It really, we've got to get away from this idea that it's kind of, it happens rhetorically in libertarian circles that a free market is just a situation where everybody does what he or she wants to do. That's crazy. I mean, Lord Acton had it right. He said, liberty is the delicate fruit of a mature civilization. It requires institutions. It re requires cultural mores, including a lack of ostentation. I actually think a kind of overconsumption ultimately will, destroys a market economy. If we literally consume more than we produce, for instance. And so there's absolutely a role to play. I would say there's an essential role to play in these kind of cultural norms, uh, even shaming a wealthy person. Now, not, I don't think you should shame someone just because they're wealthy. It depends on how they got the money and what they're doing with it. Um, but I, so far as I can tell, that happens all the time. I mean, I, I, I read the Washington Post and the New York Times, and these guys get a lot of grief. But I, you know, I, for one, would say I think that Bill Gates may have done more for people uh, as the, the head of Microsoft then he's done as a philanthropist. I don't know, I don't know, but he was giving in two different ways. So when a person is creating value in the market, they are giving, they are creating, and they are producing. Another way that you can give is philanthropy, but we shouldn't, don't fall for this pietistic idea that, well, unless you're giving your money away, right, you're, you're sort of greedy. No, it depends on what you're doing. It may be that really clever investments, because you're a good steward, right, you got rich in part because you're a really good steward of the wealth that you have, uh, that's the best thing you could do to help your fellow human being. And so we just ha we have to look at the details and avoid these kind of simple generalizations of, you know, the rich guy that's always greedy and the poor person, you know. Uh, look at the details. Hey, I'd like to thank all three of you for just a terrific afternoon. Uh, I, I hate to reduce the conversation to what I'm going to think of as an Amazon litmus test. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do it on example of preferring the local bookshop mm -hmm. over Amazon. And I'm going to offer 
for example, that hits closer to home for most of the audience here, and hopefully you, both of you have both you counted on. So when we were in college, there was no Amazon. We had a little bookstore on yeah. campus to buy books, and uh, I don't know the price of books today, $300 for some of these textbooks. Yeah. You multiply that by five classes a semester, 10 classes a year, we're talking $3,000 a year for textbooks that I've got to spend at the school bookstore. Lo and behold, here comes Amazon. I can I can send my kids, the, the students, to go buy a book on Amazon instead of uh, uh, having to go to the bookstore. Maybe they get the books for fifty dollars each. Uh, now they're spending five hundred dollars instead of three thousand dollars. I think that helps the students. I do. I let each of you address the morality of maybe saying Amazon shouldn't exist um, or Amazon doesn't do any good. So. You want to do it first. Yeah, um, I mean, I, there's no question that it's efficient and that for the consumer, it can be, it can save money. You know, um, I, I don't think there's any question about that. Um, the question is what sort of price is paid on a larger scale, kind of societally and by the people that work in the warehouses for the efficiency of saving, you know, a few bucks on the, on the price. Those are... And I think Jay was exactly right what he just said, that you've got to enter into the minute details uh, on these questions and determine those on a kind of case-by-case -case, uh, basis. But that's part of what I'm trying to do is kind of disaggregate these questions so that we neither, as I put it in my book, we neither bless nor damn the free market as such, but, um, uh, but we ask in each situation what is going to contribute to freedom here and what's not going to contribute to freedom here. And um, I, it just doesn't seem to me like the free market um, needs a whole lot of cheerleaders at this point. Um, it seems to be almost entirely dominant. And so um, it seems to me like the, if you're going to be approaching this from a Catholic moral point of view, that, um, that, that there needs to be a lot more questioning and skepticism and rather than more cheerleading for, uh, for uh, the free market, um, but it's a serious question, and I often get asked on, you know, I, I've written about um, the agriculture system and farmers markets and so on, and people say, well, it, Walmart is just cheaper than the farmers market, and um, and so are you are you kind of being an elitist? You can afford to shop at the farmers market, uh, but there's a lot of people that have to shop at Walmart. And one of my responses is that the reason that they have to shop at Walmart is because they have to work at Walmart and they get paid low wages. Low, low prices means low, low wages. Um, but the other response is that um, is the question of what, um, well, I, one of the questions I ask audiences oftentimes is, do you know what uh, organic tomatoes used to be called? And the answer is tomatoes, right? I mean, it was it, what we've turned, the, the way that we've, um, skewed the agricultural system is to make a tomato that's grown in dirt with water into an exotic luxury item and we need to be getting to, to kind of do a whole structural analysis of why things are set up that way such that certain things are incredibly cheap um, but hide the costs, hide the true social costs. Yeah, I, um, Henry Hazlitt said the art of economics consists in looking not merely at the immediate, but at the longer effects of any actor policy. It consists in tracing the consequences of that policy, not merely for one group, but for all groups. And way too much discussion about these economic things focuses on this one thing, right? Like, okay, I'm picturing, I don't know, somebody getting not paid a lot at Walmart or maybe somebody in a factory. By the way, there are very few people left in the Amazon fulfillment factories. Uh, it's almost all robots. So do with that what you will. If you don't like the being paid, they're going to be gone really quick, right? So uh, the, the question, I mean, there's a way to sort of frame it really clearly. Is society actually worse off? Are the poor worse off because Walmart exists? Um, how did Walmart get so large? Was it confiscating wealth for people? You want to know how it got so large? It broke up the local monopolies of mom and pop stores who had jacked up prices all around the country and people didn't have a choice about where to shop. And Sam Walton realized, actually, I could figure out, create a business model in which I could charge people less and they would, they would have more disposable income. That's a way of increasing your wealth. You can increase your wealth by increasing your income or by 
uh, decreasing the amount that you have to spend. That's how Sam Walton got uh, rich. So where did he go from being helpful to breaking up local monopolies to evil, right? Like where was the, the, the corporate size? I mean, the reality is he got large primarily by serving customers well. And it's the same thing with Jeff Bezos. So far as I know, he did not get wealthy uh, by doing anything illegal or sort of obviously or intrinsically immoral. Now, the, the sort of moral picture is complex, but I think it's highly unlikely if you could actually weigh all of the co genuine costs and benefits that we would say that our country is actually worse off uh, because, because Amazon and Walmart exist. Now, we might not like big companies, but this has always been the kind of reality. And usually when country companies are, are attacked for being monopolies, it's only, usually right when they cease to be anywhere near a monopoly, right? I remember this in the 90s uh, with Microsoft. So there are benefits to being large in terms of economies of scale. There are also problems with being large. There are diseconomies of scale. You tend to be kind of lumbering. So remember the giant corporations that we think about Amazon, Google, or it would be Alphabet, or Microsoft, Apple. These are country companies that didn't exist at all just a few decades ago. And it's, I think, quite likely that they will not exist or will not exist in the same form right now. And so the question is whether we're okay with a system that allows companies to get big, not by stealing from people, but by serving customers better than their competitors and to get large. Um, I don't think that's itself a bad thing, given the sort of consequences, as long as they don't actually unjustly use that in terms of monopoly power. And for various economic reasons, that almost never happens. We get the last question. Oh, Ali, thank you. Um, so I have a question uh, that I think is kind of like the intersection of a lot of the different things we've been talking about here, uh, but kind of expand it into a way that I don't think we've uh, heard the attention yet. And it's kind of the intersection between uh, this distance that we talked about with, between Amazon and the model pop shop. Uh, if the difference between, uh, it, it ties into what we were saying about how uh, we want the economy that serves the common good, and we want people to make virtuous decisions such that they care about more than just price indicators, they also care about the sustainability of the product and uh, how the work is being treated, et cetera. And uh, it ties into uh, the, like you mentioned, the changing attitudes about wealth over time and how the wealthy were once shamed, and now it's seen as a good thing and desirable thing to be wealthy. And my question is, how does our attitude about businesses as entities in themselves um, kind of tie into all of this. Because a business is, in a lot of ways, a purely economic entity. And so when we allow businesses to kind of obscure the people who are really making decisions, the people behind the businesses, as, for example, we do a lot in the legal realm where people can you know, commit a crime uh, as like the people who control the business, and then like, the business is more held responsible compared to the people who are actually running the business. And I was kind of wondering, does this view of like businesses and entities of themselves, whose goal is to uh, maximize profit, kind of obscure the fact that you know I want to that the, the economics isn't the most important thing and the only important thing in my life that I should also care about all these social things, um, because the, with the way that businesses are kind of like the main way that we talk about economics nowadays, does that kind of make me forget? the way that all these other, all these other non-economic things are relevant to the kind of decisions I make with my life. Hmm. OK. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess the question is, uh, what a business is is it's a particular association of, of persons, right? And so um, there are different kinds of associations that have in different internal logic. And so a family has a, is a particular association with its own internal logic, a lion's club, right? And a business. Um, I, I wouldn't say that, you know, there's a, I teach a class called the vocation of business. There's this question, okay, what is the, what's the actual purpose of business? Uh, um, and one late management guru said it was actually to create a customer. So it's not to make a profit. What profit does is it tells you if you're serving your customer well. It's sort of a signal. But if, in fact, if the business literally focuses only on that rather than on serving others, it will usually screw up. And so then the question is, well, um, should there be those kinds of associations or not? Well, I think absolutely. In fact, I said a minute ago that, um, like it or not, the primary way, if we look at this empirically, that wealth is created and poverty is alleviated in the actual world that God has created is through enterprise and business. It's not everything. It's not the only thing. And that doesn't mean that the economy and wealth and all those things doesn't also depend upon other associations and other institutions. But it has a purpose. And I think it's actually a good thing that we that company corporations, for instance, um, 
and there's different sort of tax statuses, right, of different corporations, but that they have particular designations and that we treat them, and Mitt Romney, I remember, got killed for saying that businesses were persons. Well, if they're not treated legally as persons, then they can't be held responsible for what they do. That's a good thing, right? On the other hand, um, we, we treat, for instance, a, a board of directors, we don't throw them personally in jail simply for the bankruptcy of a company unless they you know, did something illegal. I think that's a really good arrangement and you can look at it empirically. It doesn't mean that the particular way we do corporate governance now is the you know, sort of platonic ideal. I think uh, employee stock ownership corporations are great and we have a country where you can actually start a worker cooperative like that if you want to. That's one of the tax designations. And so I think as Catholics, we, we're really good at thinking about associations and institutions. We know that there's more than just the state and towns and the polis and individuals. There's the family, there's the church, there's these other associations. And so I think Catholic social teaching gives us a way to sort of analyze the nature of the firm and the corporation in a much more robust and less reductionist way than maybe some of the intellectual resources that our uh, fellow Americans have. Yeah, I'm going to disagree on, on part of that. I mean, I, th I think um, your original question uh, gets towards something that Pope Francis is talking about quite a bit, which is the impersonalization of the economy. And I think that's why scale matters, um, one of the reasons why scale matters. I've actually got a, a chapter in a book about um, our corporation's people. Uh, and it's a reflection on the um, Citizens United uh, decision which said that corporations are people and therefore can influence uh, the democratic process in the same way that uh, that actual human persons uh, are and I argue there that um, that Jay's right that in Catholic social teaching we don't think that persons are only individuals we have this sense of corporate personhood and I do a whole kind of history of corporate personhood that comes ultimately out of Paul's analogy of the body of Christ, right? And so corporate personhood is, is important. The difference, though, is that a business corporation, at least as it functions today, is a class divided corporate, is a class divided organization. And so it's a very different kind of body, it's a very different kind of corporate person than the body of Christ, for example, um, because there are, there are some people, because it's, it's class divided, there are some people that are capitalists and there's, there's some people that own the work, work, the means of production, and there are some people that own only their own skins. And, and those are both contained within the same, the same body, as opposed to the body of Christ, which as Paul says, the weakest member is the member treated with the greatest honor, and when one suffers together, all suffer, and when one rejoices together, all rejoice together. And those are the kinds of communities that I think we need to be, and, and, and I think it's possible for a business to be that kind of community, um, but it's not very common uh, these days, and to equate money with speech, as the Citizens United uh, decision does, I think is, is really disastrous. I want to thank both our speakers for just a terrific, really enlightening uh,